All right, now we are live and streaming. Right. So, cool. So, did you tweet it? <coughs> yep, I did. All right. So, first of all, um, well, it, it then the, the title is System Device GPIO, but like Rich and I have been talking about this, and uh, the idea is to have the one DLL, but I don't think the System Device GPIO is the right name. Uh, we We're over pivoting over. Right. on the GPIO. Right, because uh, and that's what I'm going to talk next. Uh, we plan to have four namespaces: uh, system device GPIO, which will contain all of the types that allow you to access the GPIO pins directly. This means uh, opening, closing them, uh, reading and writing to them, and subscribing for events. Mm -hmm. uh, then we plan to have a different namespace, uh, and this also kind of like uh, echoes what we have in, in, in current APIs, like WinRT APIs. Uh, so. Uh, the PWM namespace, which will contain only the pulse width modulation operations uh, and, and, and uh, like all the types that let you access that. Then the I2C and SPI namespace, which will contain uh, all of the types that are uh, using that, like for devices that use that type of protocol, uh, which for both of them, they're, they're multi-pin. Like there's a, for, for I2C, you need at least two pins uh, in order to communicate. And SPI needs at least three. Um, and, and basically, for the last, sorry, for the last three namespaces, do you ever use those without using the GPIO namespace? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So if you're implementing a sensor that uses I2C communication, you only ever interact with that namespace. You don't have to talk to GPIO at all. Yeah, logically, there's no overlap. Right. Um, so that's basically it, and and well, I mean, I don't know how how deep you guys want to go over I two C and SPI protocols in particular, but basically the main idea is uh, they use like digital uh, zeros and ones, but they also one of the pins uh, hooked up to the device is a clock, so they basically can send out like square waves that indicate messages. Uh, so that's that's mainly how they work. Also, um, there's uh, in Windows at least there's dot ABC, I see. analog digital converter, right? In space. Oh, right. ABC. Yeah. Does um, that mean you can talk to an, an analog device with a digital pin? Is that what that's for? Uh, set up the digital pins. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Um, and yeah. so. Now we're gonna go over kind of like the this is uh, what Stephen asked earlier, which is like what what are the changes between the iteration one. Uh, we mainly got uh, three sorts of feedback. Uh, if, if you can scroll down a little bit, email, please. Mm -hmm. um, so first one was uh, like small uh, changes, which in, like had casing on members didn't match what we we uh, usually do on the .NET framework. Uh, the, the member names didn't kind of mimic uh, what we usually do. Or we also had a bunch of members and types that we provided initially uh, as we thought that they would be like an extensibility point for the future uh, and and we got feedback saying that like that is probably trying to over engineer now uh, and adding base classes to a bunch of classes that uh, don't really need them today and they could just be added in the future without breaking compatibility so uh, that's why I, we we basically got rid of all of that and just basically thought of the main scenarios we wanted to support and, and that's that's just the, the types that we left exposed. Uh, then we got other types of feedback that was a little bit bigger <coughs> implementation wise, which is um, we, we talked a bunch about uh, the ownership of objects, the lifetime of when should objects be disposed, <coughs> who owns disposing them and stuff like that, whether or not we should use singleton uh, uh, implementation for a few classes. And so we did take on the singleton pattern uh, for a few of our classes, um, which we will talk about more later. Uh, but basically, uh, the API surface didn't change that much, but it does mean that we're now using factory methods and stuff like that. Um, so uh, the biggest point of, of feedback that we got, in, and it was actually some feedback that we got after the review, it wasn't actually during the review, uh, but it, this is the thing that basically changed uh, all the API surface was uh, whether or not, like the decision of whether or not we should have the pin class uh, in, uh, exposed, like as an object, or if we should just have pins. Uh, so this is something that came up uh, after, like even in the, in the actual um, 
review that uh, we post in GitHub. Uh, so it came out there, and then we started a bunch of discussions out of that. Uh, so this is what we're mainly going to talk about through this uh, review, since I think at least the functionality we already covered in the first review. So in here, we're basically just going to show you both models of how does it look without a pin class, how does it look with a pin class, and then kind of like our recommendation of why, why we picked what we picked. Um, so as for the pros of, of having a no pin object model, um, in, in this case, we would be using <coughs> integers uh, to, um, to basically represent pins. Uh, and, and I mean, we would use it, and kind of like the justification of this is that uh, pins don't really have that much state that we want to track. Uh, so then representing them just as integers is enough. Um, Another advantage is we have more discoverability of, of the full surface area because we have a flat surface area. So you just by by looking at the controller methods, you can see all of the things that you can do with a pin. It's really just less to discover. <laughs> right, basically less to discover, yeah. Um, and then uh, another advantage is that we now are more similar to other frameworks like RPI, GPIO, and Wiring Pi. Um, so for developers that are, have already working apps uh, against uh, those languages, uh, they can now basically port their code easier because we basically just expose the same, uh, the same idea. Or more likely, people are trying to write a .NET app and they don't have the implementation they need and they're trying to port someone else's code. Right. As opposed to a developer who currently has Python. Right. Part porting their, their app. Right. And right. users can still create their own GPIO pin wrapper if they want to, correct? Correct. Right. Uh, yes, but then, it, I mean, yes, they can do that. But they will still call all of the methods through the controller. Right. But yes. Right. Right. Hence the wrapper piece. They, they can do that, yeah. Um, and then, I mean, another pro is that it's just a simpler uh, model in general. Uh, the cons of this is that... Um, we uh, now have a controller class that basically for pretty much all of its um, instance methods, it takes a pin number. Uh, so if you follow kind of like the, the patterns, it will tell you that like if you have a class where all of the methods take in the same parameter, it probably means that you might want to add a new class. So in this case, we're specifically ignoring that pattern and saying uh, we want to represent them as integers instead. And then uh, another uh, con is how eventing looks like. Um, I, I added another point in there, but that's actually not true. We said that it, this one would be less object oriented, but that's not really true. And in fact, we found uh, like a bunch of, of examples in the in the framework where we use the, the pattern where we don't encapsulate everything into objects and, and it just makes sense. Um, I mean, the real idea here is to make it such that uh, representing the, uh, like for the actual users that are going to consume this, that it makes sense for them uh, to consume this API. And, and so that one is not really true. But like, at least the eventing, I think it does, look, might look a little bit more familiar to .NET developers uh, when you're using a pin model. Uh, as pin well. object. Yeah, pin object, sorry. Then when you're not using it. Um, so if we scroll down, we have some kind of like a, a little snippets of examples of how, how does it look like to do simple operations uh, when you're using the new mo well, the model with no, no pin object and the one that does have the pin object. Uh, so as you can see above, basically uh, you are calling, you're turning on and off the pin through the controller. Uh, you're passing in the integer, uh, whereas in the second one, you're basically just getting the pin object yourself and then you're calling methods into that that obviously don't need the, the integer anymore. Why do I have to open the pin before? Why can't you just do that directly from right? Uh, no, there, well, I mean, you do need to do some pre-setup uh, in most so of the, the drivers. The open pin is a full I think name it should be called in the first, first example. The so usual you, name for that method from the first the example is like set pin mode. Yeah, maybe set up pin or something. Right. <clears throat> So, I see. so basically, you need to set yeah the the mo you can't by default uh, all of the pins are set to input. So if you want to actually turn something on or off, 
uh, you need to actually set them on to be output. So, so, if it's, so if I just want to read, could I then get away with not calling setup in? Or do I always have to call it? Depends on the driver. So uh, the driver is the, the thing that will actually be performing the operations. Well, what uh, if someone turns one up, set up step in, turns it off and like runs another up? Which like, is, like, is the state going to be consistent or is it going to be different depending on like what app run before. So you mean like, like two, two run, apps trying yeah, to like, control the same pin? No, I'm like, yeah, look around one app which controls the pin, and then you run another app and... Or, or just the same app twice. Or the same app, maybe, yeah. It's fine, like, it, that's why it's wrapped uh, under a using. In theory, like, one, once the controller gets this post, it will basically reset the state of all of the pins that it... It, it, ha it keeps a state of which pins it has opened. It, it will also kind of prevent you to open a pin twice. Uh, and and uh, the controller, by the way, is the one that it's now follows follows a singleton pattern. So it basically knows uh, which pins are object uh, are opened, and it will it will prevent you from doing this. Uh, and it will in what situation would I sorry? In what situation would I choose to use the latter, uh, like you know, um, storing the GPIO pin and then using that rather than just calling the methods on the controller? Are there advantages, disadvantages to the approaches? Do I fall off a cliff with one and have to use the other, et cetera? In here, no. Like it's basically, uh, I mean, it's just the way you write the code, but implementation-wise, it, it is exactly the same and it has the exact same effect. Uh, like. The, if you have the GPIO pin class, you don't really need to dispose it. Uh, the controller will take care of that. Uh, so it's not like you're setting yourself up uh, for, for problems if you use the last implementation. Is, is there, an, I, I guess I'm trying to understand like why we expose both. Is it that we're trying to match to like different other languages that, have different approaches and so we're trying to support both? Or? No, sorry, maybe I, maybe I wasn't super clear, but we're, we're not exposing both. We're just showing okay. you the difference of the approach. You can think of the pin object model as the iteration one or how we had it before. So we're not, we don't have the second one anymore. We don't have the second one anymore, right. So to, today's proposal is to go into the uh, no pin object model. So this is just Got basically it. showing kind of like the diff of how it looked like before and how it looks like now. Would it make sense to maybe implement like a square bracket, brackets of operator on the controller and just make it controller of let equals we, two we could something. an indexer and uh, it, it's doable yeah <coughs> so and that's that, the, that would be with a pin object uh, no not necessarily no you no, no you do controller you could, of, oh. and then square brackets and you type in like the, the integer and then you basically kind of like yeah but the thing has to return something right yeah it has to return something oh right yeah 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 so i guess the indexer is not wouldn't be uh, yeah. also uh, in the in the pin object model case um, at least you would have a the LED pin and you would say you could say dot mode equals output dot mode equals input because you can change a, a pins mode you can do that as well in the new model right there's a I'll show you the full uh, I'm just saying it's, it's a property versus being a method on a control correct yes, yes. Which we have, like that's that goes again with the eventing kind of thing. We're we're going to show <coughs> an example of that. Uh, yeah, and then like I said, if if you did prefer the object model for whatever reason, then the no pin object model has all the appropriate things to create a wrapper. wrapper you thing. could create your own GPIO pin in your own code and right. then follow the object, the Correct. object model. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So so the, of... so the no pin allows you to do one or either. Right, because this is the, the the first one is effectively lower level. Right. Um, so I, I just want to raise one concern, and maybe this isn't the right time to review to raise it, but um, like these these examples are mostly um, app oriented, meaning um, it isn't entirely clear to me that um, well. It isn't doing anything. Well, the, the thing I want to make sure is like when people write libraries, like what is the guidance for them? Do they write? Um, presumably, they don't write this using <coughs> statement because they they don't necessarily right. know when to dispose of the controller. Right. So then, do they have to have a controller method? Sorry, a controller um, parameter in kind of all of their methods or they have to like kind of have this init thing they that will, takes a controller that's yeah. um 
basically in their constructor they would have yeah. a, a controller they, they would take in a controller you need it save it in a, in a private uh, yeah. variable and then when they are disposed of then they would basically uh, go in and, and close the controller I mean controller. I would say it depends on the library right? I mean if you have a minor library that I don't know like handles like particular lights or whatever then I think that's probably what you would do if you have a more you know, end-to-end -end solution, like I think Christoph came up with this robot example, right, where you have like a pre-canned robot basically, and that thing takes care of everything, and then you're sure. just supposed to call robot dot Go. Do, do stuff, right? Yeah. Then they would own the controller, right? But I think it's generally true for libraries that you don't want to take over the lifetime of things. Although, although the question, you like the robot is probably not one method. Like the robot then would be basically the app. Yeah, you would say would yeah, you would say new it, robot. The robot itself would be disposable, and then when you dispose and, that, it would. And then it would be control. it would be calling into a bunch of libraries. So, well, you could imagine like literally, I just write a robot library, right? And then my robot class just wraps the controller effectively. No, but and I'm then just saying, all my methods all, just directed to whatever you want yes, to do. Yes, all I'm saying is, you've just changed where the app boundary is, because the robot class, it's probably then going to be calling a bunch of libraries that talk to servos and sensors, and then you have that same question again. Yeah, you, you'd probably well, have one library per, yeah, per right. sensor. Does it even make sense, to make, like, right. maybe it make sense to make it static or something? That was basically where I was heading, is, yeah. is it possible because then, um, then A, it's like, well, what happens if you create two, like to do two, uh, well, is it going to reset you the other one? Or you, you basically can't, can't do yeah. that. So, so what the, the Python examples do is they're just static methods, GPIO dot, and then the thing, and then if they're static, then you don't have the problem I just raised, which is what is what do you have to specify in the argument to libraries? Because then it's just ephemeral type um, method calls. So the reason why we don't have those methods to be static right now, and, and we have them as instance methods, is because we haven't gotten into the get controller method yet. But there is state in a controller. Basically, there's two things of state in the controller. One is the driver, uh, that is basically uh, the thing that knows uh, how to perform operations on a specific board. But that can be handled with static reg on registration on a static method, it, right? It could be, yes. Yeah. yeah, I thought we had discussed in the last meeting that the, the concept of the thing that the user gets might carry the state, but internally there might still be a singleton for the actual device. That way you can separate the concept of there's state that the user needs to clean up versus there's a device that you can only ever have one of. That is the controller, yeah. basically. So we don't have it as a static, like that. this is the singleton, basically. The controller is. And yeah, I mean, we could, we could definitely do it with, if we do all static methods, we could do that as well. We would just have to have static properties instead for the driver. It, it, I, think, I think my only point is it feels like it would be a better user experience because <coughs> you avoid having to pass this controller all yeah, the cause, time. Because you could imagine the case where you have like a pie and you want to manage two sensors individually. And so you want to manage those pin states separately but ultimately you still have one controller instance at the root that has to be shared between the two states that the u that the libraries are controlling. I see. And it does seem odd to me to have a singleton be disposable. Yeah, because uh, I, I think it just comes down to you actually have the singleton, which is the physical device, and then you've got state, which is disposable, that users can get from the controller and maintain. Okay. for the lifetime of that particular yeah, so There is kind of tension whether this is really designed for Raspberry Pi. In that case, you know, the singleton controller, you know, you, it's like unnecessary abstractions. Or whether this should be, this is like some abstraction designed for, oh, you have some, some device that has, you know, multiple maybe boards with pins attached to it and each of the boards has like its own controller, you know. Yeah, it gets to the concept like, so I gave this as an example last time where you have DirectX where you've got the, in the DirectX APIs they expose the adapters which are the physical devices and they, then they dispose the DirectX graphics device which is the virtual layer that the user actually sends the drawing APIs through at the higher layer.
And so you've got that physical versus logical abstraction for, I've got something that, you know, there is only a singleton because it physically exists in the real world. And that could be a microcontroller, it could be a sensor, it could be, you know, a device with multiple other controllers that it, you know, owns. But then you've got that logical abstraction of, well, you have two apps that both need to be able to draw to the thing simultaneously, so you need to have a logical state for each of those apps that goes through the physical thing. Mm -hmm. Right, so are we, is this optimized for the abstract case or for just the Raspberry Pi case? Well, I mean, right now we don't have any requirements for, and I, I don't mean we don't have any motivation, I mean we don't have any concrete requirements to drive a more complicated design. Right. So even if we wanted to build something along the lines of what you generally describe, I'm not sure we would know what to build. Right, like I agree with that, that you don't even know how to build that. Because yeah, because those don't things even, don't exist. Right? Yeah, it's a little <laughs> magical right now. So <laughs> it feels like we should target something we do understand, which is the the pie scenario. The question just is like, how do you evolve this, right? So one thing you, you could be doing is you could say you have a GPI controller aesthetic class today, and then everything aesthetic methods. But then if you ever want multiple controllers, there you basically have to introduce a new type. Because all the aesthetic types would not, aesthetic methods would not conflict with the ones you would put on the instance. Another way of doing it is to say the GPI controller type is not static. Everything is an instance memory. You just have a global static read only whatever like instance thing. And that's then, like dot current. Yeah, and then you basically don't have it I disposable in V one. And then V two, if you want to have multiple controller instances, what you would just do is you would just you know actually give people a public constructor or a static factory method, make it implement I disposable make it somewhat clear that, this, that the static shared instance can't be disposed and throw an exception if somebody tries to dispose that one by passing in the flag to the constructor and saying, like, I'm the magic instance or whatever, or you just compare it in the dispose, I guess could also work. And then you just basically go from there. Right? And then basically people just change their code from you know, invoking it on the, on, the, on the shared instance to whatever else they yeah, want to do. I mean, it's a bit more, like, not quite as disruptive. I think anymore. it would still break, though, because... This goes back to my comment on what is what are you passing into the libraries? Imagine the, most libraries don't take um, a controller; they just they just reference um, dot current. Yeah, dot they current. just dereference dot current, and then that's exactly the same problem, at, almost as the static method. Well, no, that's all the true. Code needs I think, to be updated. So I think <clears throat> it's fair to change. It's fair to say that code needs to change. It's just that we don't have to introduce a new API. Right. Like you have a little bit less legacy in terms of I, API I, service. Like I think it's very likely that five years from now, the way you, you know, program these GPIO things will look completely different. There will be kind of you know consolidation going on. Like the, might be that people won't like worry about the SPI. Cool. You know that that thing, this thing. You know. You're saying the changes might not be of this kind. There might yeah. be something totally different. I, right. I, I can I think, think like in five years we might create like a I don't know like a virtual. GPIO or something, and like you're kind of on the desktop, but you kind of still communicate with the thing, so it might just implement your module instead of like just actual device. So. Uh, right, but how would that affect the API design? Uh, yeah, like if you so just if, be a if you make, make it so that you support like multiple devices, so like from the day one, basically you can just add like a, a kind of like entry on the like a list or something. And, just how you do it. This device, I can set up pin, but it, like actually the physical device is somewhere else, and it will just set it. Right, but we could build point. that with this same API, yeah, cool. meaning that would be like the remoted, mm -hmm. the remoted driver, and you just need to, um, like if we had a registration model for registering a new device, that's the device you would register. It would all just work, I think. Right. right. I, I think, at least today, there, there's a fairly good model for how the physical devices are set up in that you, you have a microcontroller, and for the Raspberry Pi, that is the Pi itself. That microcontroller has a set of pins, which may have varying communication mechanisms, but at the root, you, you still have the pins. They take inputs and outputs, and you can, from that pin set, have a sub-microcontroller which then can have its own pins, et cetera, and that just goes all the way down. Um, but, you know, at the root, you have the microcontroller that communicates with other sensors or controllers, which can, you know, do that themselves. Right. There's people who have taken Raspberry Pis and hooked them up together. There's people who have taken Raspberry Pis and a breadboard and put in 
8088 on it and created their own, you know, minimal IBM PC and had it control through the Pi through that microcontroller mechanism there. And if, if we expose a way that users can represent that logically and maintain that state themselves from that root microcontroller, then I think we'll be in at least a state where we can extend for some time. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's all good, good feedback. Um, definitely, yeah, and it's, it's, it's a providing an extensibility point, as you guys mentioned, so that's interesting. Um, if, if you want to scroll down, you know, I would like to go, uh, like, these are just other examples, but if you could scroll down all the way to where uh, we go to the eventing, uh, so that's right before PWM, uh, yeah, that one, registering for a callback. So yeah, although we should get some feedback on the other one, because it's event, kind of, poor man's eventing. So which one is? Well, we can do the other your one first, but I think we should go back to to which one to this wait to for wait event? for event result. We should get some feedback on that as well. Oh, okay, because that feels like poor man's eventing. Okay, for this particular one, uh, I kind of uh, followed what uh, File System Watcher does. Uh, so, uh, and this is a, a discussion that I had with Stephen. Uh, so basically, uh, wait for event is a method that would uh, halt execution, and it would. It, it, had, it has a timeout, and basically it would watch for specific uh, event types in, in a pin. And then uh, if the timeout, uh, it, it returns back a wait for event result uh, object, which basically control, uh, contains only a boolean of whether or not the operation timed out. And if you did get an event, it also provides uh, the event type of, of what, what was the thing that you, uh, what was the event that was raised. Uh, Could this be a, uh, a uh, nullable pin event? Can this be a what? Sorry? A nullable pin event? So if it's null, it timed out? Uh, we could do that, yeah. For this particular one, we just mimic what we had in File System Watcher, okay. which does return an object and does have a timed out uh, <coughs> property. So we just went with... This is minor. Time. Sorry, this is minor, but I wonder if it would be better just name something like poll which is a, you know, an understood term on Unix, for example, when waiting for something on a file descriptor or in the networking space, regardless of OS. Okay. The name we basically took as well from, uh, because of the same reason of we wanted to be, uh, like have uh, Raspberry Pi users, I mean, RPI, RPI GPIO users to be able to port this code easier. Uh, for so this is the name that it, that's, our, that's used consistently elsewhere? Right, this is what is used in RPI GPIO. Uh, and also they have uh, wait for event. That's why we we picked that name. But but it discoverability it, wise, poll as a Windows developer, poll doesn't tell me anything about is this a blocking call, whereas wait for sure tells me that it's it's a blocking call. I, I think I asked this last time, but I don't remember. Why isn't this just task? And so we have a wait for event async as well. We okay. added that, uh, so we have both. What are our thoughts on this? Like Stephen pointed out last time, I mean, you have wait for event, you have effectively a race condition, right? If you you can end up in that lock because you miss events, depending on how the you way the event. implementation will change. So basically, the way we would do it is we would have kind of like two threads running in the background, uh, where you have as well. It's it's very similar to File System Watcher, where you have a queue, a buffer queue. I see. So you buffer events effectively. Right, you buffer okay. them. So there's one thread that's basically just monitoring for the events and putting them on the queue. And then there's the other thread that's basically processing those. Do we drain the queue? That like nobody queue. calls wait for event ever. Uh, or do we yeah, well, after the thread? timeout, we should we should drain the queue. Yeah. And right now we don't expose it currently, but uh, there's uh, I mean there might be a scenario where in the future we could add some API that basically tells you uh, the number of changes that are the number of events that you got in a period of time. So you could kind of like try to monitor that. It makes sense that. to maybe take a cancellation token in there. So cancellation token supports the timeouts. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you could like if someone presses the other button, you could cancel we, the other event. We could. The async method takes a cancellation token. Uh, I don't understand the, the draining. So let's say I, I, I knew of the controller, right? I never call wait for event. 
So we have to already, like when you know of the, the, the controller, we have to basically buffer events in the case you ever call wait for wait. For no, we event. won't be monitoring for events, right? We won't be, at, at that point, we won't be monitoring for events on, until you subscribe, until you say, I want to wait for this specific pin. I want to, well, I want to get notified. So it, there's two eventing models uh, One is, that we support. One is the wait for event, with, uh, which is the blocking one. And then you, have, you could register for a callback. So if you do any of those two, then we will start listening for events. If not, then the we won't we won't get the interrupts. Yeah, because the raising maybe the maybe I misunderstood <laughs> last time. Wait, if you if I do two wait for event calls in a row, and the event happens after the first one is returned, but before I call the second one, does the second one notice it or not? It it won't. That is so case, right? that's a problem. It's like, how do you like say wait for two buttons at the same time? Like, because like this is a pretty common scenario. Like, you want to implement like a request one. Well, one would one not be the async case. Yeah. Yeah, but it seems like the logic for that would be like pretty complex versus like writing that like natively in like uh, like just C or something. Well, in that case, you would probably register for a callback instead, right? Well, but or you do a wait test when all or wait for an async wait for yeah, an async. The only thing that's strange about that though is it'd be weird. If the, you like, you write the code. You, if you only are waiting on one thing, then you've got two choices on how to write it. But if you're waiting for n things, then you have to go to the eventing pattern. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I, I guess I think we're talking about multiple things here. I, I don't think that's true that you have to go to the eventing pattern. I think, uh, I mean, if, if by the eventing pattern you mean the callback one, the the you know the event handler one, oh, yeah. because if if I had two different buttons and I wanted to wait for both of them to be signaled, I can do make two calls to wait for event async one for each and then say wait all. Yeah. Um, but the the bigger issue for me is the one that we just <laughs> talked about, which is um, the, the big mean? problem with File System Watcher is it is lossy. Any events that occur while you're not waiting go away. And so if I tried to write, you know, just a, a the, the, you know, a very simple loop where I was waiting for every press of the button, it's it's going to miss some if I have, you know, multiple calls for wait for events in a row. And if and if in the double case, if we were waiting for two buttons, you know, and one of them got pressed between the two calls, uh, we're going to sit there waiting forever because one was pressed and the other one wasn't. Should we so maybe... So one way, one way, yeah, one way to fix this is, because it's kind of like the way uh, that we had it in the previous API. Uh, in the previous API, we exposed uh, enable raising events uh, on, on the pin. So in here, we could have a similar thing where we just start listening, even though you haven't actually called wait for event. But you could just start listening and then start filling up that queue. And in that case, if you get the event, after, as long as you set enable raising events before, uh, if you get the event before you call wait for event, then you would still get the event. Uh, so we could expose that as well. Kind of like a way to control of like, I want to start listening for events. I, I wouldn't like to just have the controller automatically when it's newed up to start listening for events. I don't think that's a good idea because uh, like you're going to get a bunch of interrupts. So that makes sense. But I think, I think we can say before you ever call wait for event, you don't have to observe anything. But as soon, as soon as you call it once and you have a loop around it, you, you want to observe everything that is happening between the calls. So right? how wait for event, uh, how uh, this similar thing work, works in File System Watcher is you do have the both things. You have wait for event and you have an enabler that basically starts listening. So what wait for event does is it checks if enable raising events is set to true. If it's not, then it sets it to true, it waits for the timeout to expire, and then it sets it sets it back to the original state. So it won't affect, like, all the code that ran before uh, wait for event and after, the state will be the same. You, you won't be, if you weren't, uh, like, catching events before, then you won't be catching events after. But if you already have it turned on, then the call to wait for event won't turn it off. Do you see what I mean? Is this possibly worth a more complicated design where the user can actually manually query and peek at the messages and events that are coming into it from the device rather than having it all abstracted away because in this current model basically the internally the controller will listen to events put it in a buffer and <clears throat> then when the wait for event calls 
eventually the buffer will get drained out, but maybe it's worth allowing the user to actually be like, I want to peek at the top message in the queue. I want to be able to get the message from the queue. I want to wait for the next message to come into the queue, see what it is, and determine what I want to do with it myself. It's a very low level API then, but it's similar to how like Win32 message function works. I mean, for me, that would be, forget wait for event for a moment, that would be a callback where you're just getting notified for every message and you get to decide what you want to do with it, whether you want to keep it or throw it away. Right. Which I think is the similar model. Yeah. Right. Well, of course, we were discussing, too, that um, <clears throat> instead of having a uh, enable wait, like we were talking mm -hmm. about, that we automatically do that when you subscribe to it. Right. The but, event. We, but in this case, you would have to do it at when, the, when this is called. Yeah, we could have both, like File System Watcher exposes both, as I said. And so what we can do is we cannot, we can like not force the developer to have to call enable raising events uh, whenever they, they want to just wait for an event. So we can internally like flip that on while we're waiting for an event. Uh, and then I, we could- Sorry, I just, we, we, keep, we keep citing File System Watcher. I, I don't think we should cite File System Watcher. I think this API on File System Watcher is terrible. Okay. Um, in fact, we didn't, I, I explicitly cut it for .NET Core and then we brought it back for 2.0 when we brought back, you know, all the APIs for compatibility, but I wish it wasn't there because it, it is so prone to, prob to problems. Yeah, I think, I mean, one thing you could be doing, right? You could say you have this anywhere raising event, whatever you called it originally, right? And if you say you call wait for event, we, we, set whether, we see whether it's checked, and if it's not, we throw it, say you have to enable this. And then basically, as soon as you enable it, we buffer. And we stop buffering when you disable that. We could do, In which but case, that the was user kinda... controls basically the lifetime of the, of right. the, of the buffer. The problem with that is that, between, you know, that, is, that is more or less what we presented at first, and like the first iteration, and the feedback there was, why do I have to make two calls when wait for no, the feedback event? was that it's prone to errors, because basically you forget to set it on, the code looks fine, but nothing ever happens, right? Versus in this case, if you'd forget it, the, you, 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 the, as soon as you call wait for event, we throw an exception and say embedded operation, you have to turn on the phone. Okay. Otherwise, we don't. We, so in this case, usability, yeah, it's, it's, you don't see it, but if you ever run the code at least once, you will immediately be told what to do instead. But at that point, you have a, you have a very clear lifetime semantics of your, of your queue, and it's clear that if you don't drain it, then bad things will happen. But I think... I would agree with like Stephen that I mean honestly like if you can avoid the problem altogether and just say the only way you get an event is by subscribing, and we dispatch it to you and then you either drop it on the floor or you don't then it's all on you. Okay. Which yeah. So I I, I think last time I'd missed her, so from talking with uh, Jose offline, I, I was under the impression that wait for event would be able to, in addition to listening in to what comes, I thought I would also be able to query the current state and determine whether there was sort of something waiting at the hardware layer. Uh, if that's not true, I think just we're setting ourselves up for failure with this. We could try and simulate it by, you know, rather than having a quote, quote, buffer that buffers everything, you have a buffer that buffers, buffers one thing. And once there's something there, it just stops listening until that thing is consumed. And then it waits, you know, then it buffers the next thing. So that at least wait for event would be able to pull, uh, uh, pull off something if something had happened. You know, multiple things could be coalesced into a single one, but um, there would at least be something there. So maybe we, we think about something like that. So what does Python do? The problem do in this with case? that is that it would it would basically um, if, if you do that, you would miss events if you get two events. Like if if you get two button presses, then you haven't actually like finished uh, processing the first one, right? That's true, but the same thing happens if you have, and I, I totally agree with you, um, the same thing happens with this wait for event API as you currently have it defined. Yeah. You know, there are like two ways, like like the naive, naive users, right? It's like when you just start hacking these things, right? You don't need this API. You basically just write a pull. That's, that's pool, what I did. Blue right. print, and it just basically you read the pen, you know, do stuff, you know, if it is the same as before, you do nothing. And you just set your thread sleep at the right <clears> granularity. 
Uh, or not even to, do not you, you don't even need to just speak, right? It's like just keep on spinning. Just keep on spinning. Yeah, it's like yeah, the, the chip gets a little bit hotter, but who cares? <laughs> <laughs> There's like this GPI operation. I, I don't remember like what is it called, but on the lowest level, there is an operation like if you just call it in the loop, it will like wait, wait one cycle, but it will not like heat up the device like if you do it. I, I forgot what was it called, but something like pulse or, or something along this line. Yeah. But like I, I remember, like if you use that operation, like and you just use the tight loop, it just works right, and it doesn't. It yeah, are you saying it up. basically pulls the pin at the fastest granularity that the pin can put up signals without making the device happy? Yes. Yeah. That, that also assumes that also assumes, and maybe this doesn't matter in these scenarios, but it assumes that the processing you do after you read the pin. Does it is is so fast that you can call read again before the next happen? The right, next event happens. It's, it's like for the simple, simple, you know, kind of you just started hacking on it. Just this, you know, you don't worry about speed of processing. So you can't, okay. you don't have time to write enough code to, <laughs> to, to, to make it matter. Right? And you know, once you kind of move on, you start seeing. Oh, you know, I would like to uh, wait for network and you know for something being pressed on the uh, on the device right and once you do that I think you kind of the, you, you start you need to wait for multiple things right so I think these are the kind of two two patterns to uh, optimize for one is kind of the na naive user that just you know the my first hello GPIO program for that you know like the wait for events it's just complication right and the other one is oh you know I just I have like web service in Azure, you know, that kind of drives my device and you know. So how would the code look like? You basically have a while true loop and then you just say if controller dot pin one is pressed do something, is that yeah. no, like it, well if if it's high. Yeah, whatever the well, yeah. but but basically you would expose the state of all the pins yeah. as static things basically that you can just well, no, 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 no. You, in in the while loop you you read the value of Pin six, specific and you see if it's high. Oh, so then you just call like I don't know, pin one dot read or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Well, so may maybe something we could do here for the case where we don't want to always pull, but we do want to pull for loops is we could have a controller dot like start listening event that returns a object that itself has the wait for event and while that object it returns is live and not disposed, it, you know, queues up the buffers and the messages. And then we so have something have like that on a GPIO uh, pin, pin reader, I think. Yeah. Change event reader or something Yeah, like and that. so then yeah. you would Change basically reader. have using yeah. controller dot start listening That's your while loop and it keeps a buffer and close using. And and the that, other, the that other reason, reason, one reason we have that is so that you can do, um, the, the kernel actually fills that buffer, so mm -hmm. that way user modes not having to sit there and, and slow things down with mm -hmm. the event queue. Right. Just and the reason why switches. that would be interesting, Stephen, and, and why like the buffer queue not being <laughs> just one is interesting, apart from, from not missing events, is that then in the future, which is not in the current API, is there there's also scenarios where, like for example, if you have a, a motor that rotates, uh, then uh, you might want to uh, know how many times did it rotate. And in order to calculate that, you can check like how many events did you get in a specific pin. Um, so that, that, that makes sense. Then um, I don't know, I mean, we're targeting this API at a particular audience, so I don't know that I want to do what I'm about to say, but we have other APIs and other libraries that are entirely about buffering and then accessing buffered data and controlling how all that behaves, like the system threading channels library. Um, you could imagine having the start buffering, whatever API here, return a channel, and then the, the user can choose how they want to consume the data from it, um, and basically it'd be the equivalent of the event here just adding stuff into a channel or whatever buffer that we actually end up exposing. Um, and then at some point you call stop and it stops doing that. Okay, that's interesting. So you would have that plus the registering for a callback, right? So that would be kind of like the two eventing scenarios that you would want to support. Right, I mean essentially it's uh, it's just a different version of the callback, right? You, if, imagine you only expose the callback on this API. 
um, then the callback could either be something the user registered with to do whatever they wanted, or you could imagine we have our own registration for that that takes everything that's raised and puts it into a channel or a buffer or whatever you want to call it, and that buffer is ex then also exposed to the user so that they could read from it at their, you know, whenever they wanted to. I see. Um, but again, I don't know the audience for this and whether we want to expose that kind of buffering information. It sounds like maybe Windows is doing that in, in its APIs. Um, well, another so we interesting consider something scenario similar. might be the case where the user is using both wait for event and callbacks, maybe for slightly different scenarios. Um, and how do you coalesce the buffers then? Well, my suggestion is you 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 expose the buffer that's being used right, internally. Right. So when, when you're calling wait for event, you're not calling wait for event on the controller, you're, <laughs> you're asking the channel, give me the next thing. Yeah. Um, okay. And it's so it's all the same buffer. Okay, makes sense. All right, uh, so after that, we can go to the callback part of it. Uh, Sorry, so what is the conclusion of this one? What are we going to, to, to do now? So are we keeping them? Just sounds like there's more. Sounds like there's more exploration to be done. Yeah. Right. Okay. So then, then. I have one very different question about this, which is, how does it interact with debounce? For now, we don't really expose a debounce. We don't expose a way of saying stop listening for a little uh, while, which is actually like our GPIO does expose it. So we don't have it in our current shape. Windows takes care of it in the kernel. We just give the debounce to that. Right, so that you don't get um, noise. Right. right. So, what is debounce for people that don't work with hardware every day? Uh, debounce means like if you keep, I don't know, if you press like I don't know, you you, you set the debounce timeout of two hundred milliseconds, for example, so that if a pin goes from zero to one, zero to one, you only get one event. If it's less than two hundred like milliseconds, if you turn a button on, it's like. Yeah, you think you push the button once, but there's enough electrical noise of things jumping around that. That's what I use. Capacitors. The the reason why so in the first iteration we did have debounce, and that's because we exposed all of the different event types, which was not just rising and falling. We exposed all of the different ones that the actual hardware support. Um, so in that case, like there was a high, for example. So in that one is way more prone to the what what John was uh, explaining. So like the 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 little current and, and you getting a bunch of, of events, rising and falling, which are the only ones that we're exposing right now. It's basically when the value, the internal value of the current turns from zero to one, and from one to zero, which in a press of a button, it only happens once. What happens for devices like um, analog sticks where the <coughs> value is almost never exactly 0 or 1? It's sometimes like 0 0.95. In the unit, so for this, we look at the value exposed by the SysFS. Like for all of this, we use uh, SysFS interface uh, mm -hmm. in Linux. And so for that one, it does have a value uh, file that only shows value of 0 or 1. So even if it's an analog pin, it would show you a zero or one, and it does it. It's rounding by itself. So and and so this polling basically just looks at that file. You're basically saying we're not exposed to that. Right. If we were to go and expose all of the event type from the hardware, then we would be exposed to that, and I think that then we would have to support debound. We we don't do it now because that's that's something that Wes raised in the, in the previous review where. There's so many pin event types that I don't really care about. Uh, so the only really thing that I that I care about is when the value, uh, the digital value is going from zero to one and a one to zero. Is the user at least able to control the threshold for the digital value? What do you mean? So, so you said that there's the internal value and it gets rounded. Right. Is the user able to control at what threshold it rounds up? No, no, down? it doesn't. SysFS does it for you. Like the the file just changed the value from zero to one or one to zero. You don't see the actual current that you're getting. You only get that, the full value. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's about debounce. Uh, can you scroll down a little bit, uh, Emo, for the callback scenario? This is, I think, one of the. Uh, points that initially kind of like pushed us over to use the, the older model, the pin model, as opposed to uh, the 
the no pin uh, object model. Uh, as you can see in in the in the line, the second snippet, uh, that one is where you do have a GPIO pin. And that one, it, it does look uh, a little bit more like .NET, or it feels more like .NET to have an event handler, which is on value changed, where you can just pass in your delegate. Uh, or write a lambda. Right. Okay. Since that one is also kind of like using our previous uh, API, it does also have like the enable raising events, which is what we just talked about. Uh, and then you can also set the notify filter for that specific pin, and you set it to which type of events you want to listen to. Actually, I think in the pin object model, you wouldn't have enable raising events because that would that would be implicit in the subscription to the uh, value change. We we could do both, right? Mm. I mean, the, the piece of feedback, like the way it was implemented on, on V1, uh, mm -hmm. on iteration one, you did have to manually specify an enable raising event. Right. We did get the feedback that basically when you add stuff to, you, to the event handler, we should automatically flip enable raising events to true. Yeah. So that is also a possibility, but at least the way it was implemented initially, you okay. would have that's to do this. Okay. Yeah. And that's different than, I think, Emo's feedback. <clears throat> before about needing an explicit model, right? That, that feedback doesn't apply to this, right? What do you mean about it, the explicit model? Um, well, he was saying, like, if we have this, the other thing, the weight, the weight thing, mm -hmm. that um, you should have to explicitly opt in to this queue being f filled and explicitly opt into it not being filled. Right. The event registration, that seems like it's different because most of the time with an event, you just leave it registered the whole time as opposed to clear it. So you'd want, you'd want, um, uh, you can still clear it, right? You, you should can. be able to still control it. You can. I guess, I guess the question is, is in order to satisfy this event registration, um, are we having to, um, uh, like yeah, constantly read the um, the pin manually, and uh, shouldn't have to. No, that's no, we just keep all on the same value. And that I think that's what Stephen was saying too earlier, which is, in what I mentioned, we need to like coalesce these two models because in both cases you're going to have some kind of buffer system. <laughs> it's just in the former case you might be man manually managing it, whereas in this case the controller might be managing it for you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so it makes we, sense to just like make a no pin object, but like also add an event, but like for all of the buttons at the same time, and then you just have like a bit mask telling, hey, I want to listen to this guy and this guy and this guy. And yeah, like some kind of. So you want to op open several pins at the same time? Yeah, like let's say like you have 10 buttons connected, like a, I don't know, numeric pad or something, and you just want to have like one event and like. Now I see. And we then, do have, and then you can like map from the number to the actual. Uh, we we could do that. For now, what we do is we have open pins uh, where you can pass like in a nine. With this guy, it would be like a kind of a pin to write the same code. Yeah. Like, but once if you have like a pin number, it's like it's like a pretty. Although, do those numeric pads? I mean, I've seen I've seen those devices. Do those tend to use GPIO or do they use higher level protocols? I, I actually am not sure, but okay. I probably like depends like what are you using. Some probably might be like <coughs> either implemented through like some kind of protocol or. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think in most cases, once you get over a certain number of sensors, yeah. whatever they are, you end up having to have a microcontroller of some sort to manage that state because there's not enough pins on the root device to yeah. talk to anybody. Yeah, they, they might sometimes they also multiplex and they just say, hey, like one of the buttons was pressed and then the other four pins like info like which number was pressed. Yeah. So that, that's kind of, they, they really depends on the device. Uh, like and more than like I'm, I'm, I'm also not sure that you would necessarily want on value change to automatically start pushing events because you could imagine a scenario where you have a more complicated device and you want to set up several callbacks before enabling events to be fired because it makes managing your overall state easier. Like you, yeah, like on, on value change, that's the old model. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like the, the new well, model is the one in the first snippet. Yeah, but I guess it applies to... Maybe the same thing for yeah, it applies yeah, add to callback the where right. you, might, you might have like two buttons and you want to register both of them, 
because you might do something different. Yeah, well, yeah if you have a like, a single event, then you could always subscribe, and there is no problem. I mean, you can just put a parameter yeah, array at the very end. Yeah. Which is the buttons, but the same registration type. Right. <coughs> So just, just to make sure the events are delivered on the yeah, type. Maybe right? you call it a class instead of pin, like pin setup or something like that. Have it on the controller. Did you hear Jan's question? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are the events delivered on the thread always? Or then are the events delivered? Um, we haven't implemented that yet. Like the so it's kind of you know interesting detail because of like the moment if they are delivered on the thread pool, like. This this will kind of always get you into hey you know I need to have like multi threading clocks and you know all the complexity that comes with it. So do you have a suggestion? Well, the alternative would be async. With async, you kind of can stay on the single thread and kind of can you know it's it, 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 it different way you, you kind of reason about it. Okay. And then. Well, lastly, I wanted I wanted to go over basically like kind of like a real world scenario because uh, this is something that Richard and I uh, started talking about yesterday. Which, uh, what would the actual end user or like what is what we're striving for? What would the apps would look like? Uh, so can can you scroll down a bit? Yep. You know, My job here is to scroll. Yeah. You turn more and more. Do a great job. All the way down to the real. So a very world poor man's version of a touchpad. Pure pure feedback is going to be awesome this year. <laughs> A little bit more, yeah. yeah. A little bit, a bit more, more. Yeah. Little just more. to the real world example. Little little more. More. Yeah. So I think this is basically what the actual customer we're aiming for. So this is basically a scenario where um, I want to write an app that runs in my Raspberry Pi that talks to a, like a temperature sensor. In order to get temperature readings, uh, I'm going to install this this Raspberry Pi in my uh, daughter's bedroom, and then. I want to send the data of the temperature readings to an Azure IoT Edge, and then I want to get notifications in my phone of whether or not the temperature is too hot or too cold so that I can talk to my Nest or whatever to, mm -hmm. to adjust the temperature. Uh, so in this scheme, uh, we will end up having three components. It's going to be the console application that, that I'm going to write, uh, and that one is the one that's only going to talk to the sensor, gets the, get the temperature readings, and then talk to um, Azure. There's going to be the sensor library, which is what we kind of have been talking about uh, right now. And that will expose basically the read temperature methods and all that. And then there's the system de device the GPIO library, which is the one that we're, uh, we're proposing in here. So the main idea is that if we provide the integer only model, uh, then console application doesn't really need to know at all anything about system device GPIO. You can basically abstract that completely. And the console application can only talk uh, to the sensor library. I mean, well, you could also talk to system device GPIO if you wanted to. But then... But in the mainline case. In the mainline case, they're just talking to a sensor library, which that one is in, in, in turn talking to our library. Uh, so, and here, uh, this, this kind of uh, like brought up some questions of if we use one model or the other one, uh, how, like... Uh, does, does my console app need to know about system device GPIO library? Uh, who owns the setting up all of the pins and who owns the disposing of the pins and the controller? And uh, well, can I just say one time thing? Sure. Like the really interesting case would be if there was another using directly underneath that one that had a light sensor as well. So maybe you have a different policy or changing the temperature when the when it's daytime versus nighttime. Like, you right. know, your, your daughter's yeah, underneath the covers at night, so who cares if she's cold? Um, and then the, the reason why that's interesting is you're basically assuming the um, the temperature sensor and the light sensor are both using GPIO. Right. And then so how do they how do they use the GPIO controller in some kind of a collaborative way? Now, obviously we're assuming you're passing them different PIN numbers, so there's no right. way there's no sharing of pins, it's just on the controller. The, the way we are implementing it right now is it, that should just work as long as you pa pass in different sensors. The reason is the controller is going to be the same controller because it's a singleton. So inside both libraries, they would be getting the exact same uh, controller. It would know which pins are used and which ones are not by each library. And so it would be able to just read and write data from both of them. Right, but the assumption would be that because this is 
using the disposable pattern here, obviously. If you have, um, uh, are, are you assuming that the, the, the sensor is disposing of the controller as part of its implementation, as part of its disposing, or not? Because it gets complicated if you have multiple, multiple. usings of multiple different sensors that are completely uncoordinated, like from different developers. Right. In this particular case, since we're just using the one sensor, then yes, we're basically assuming that the BME 280 sensor right. is disposing right. the controller. Right, but just, just to be super clear. If we wanted to have two object, uh, two sensors and two libraries talking to the GPIO controller, then that it would basically change the model well, well, or the console application would own kind of like the life of the controller. And then that would be the one that's in charge of... Right. But like the app and the sensors are all from completely different people. So the fact that you're only using this one sensor in this particular app, the developer has no notion of that, meaning the developer of the sensor. Yeah, this gets into the whole thing of should a singleton be disposable? And that's kind of complicated. Right. So the, the, the guy who wrote this thing, the sensor, right. that person can make no assumptions about how many sensors are being used at once in your application. So we need to give um, one piece of guidance to that developer to do the lowest con common denominator type yeah. thing. Also, the thing like uh, like when you're uh, doing like kind of this pattern, like how do you know like if the pins are already set up or should you set, up, set them up for the device? So like, uh, in you can set up the same pin. Yeah, so but do you, uh, are you responsible for that or the library? Is library. No, the library is. Yeah. Okay. In this model, the library is. If you if you scroll down just a little bit, uh, Emo, you'll see how the model would be but with then the if, previous. If we like assume there are gonna be more devices in the future, like how are you gonna change, uh, like which? It's the same, system? right? The library would be in charge of setup and cleanup. Like they should be the ones to be setting up every oh. pin. Because you're just passing in integers. You're not passing in pin objects that are already pinned. That's well, the whole point I, of the abstraction. I, yeah, and right. well, I think the other point, though, is yeah, imagine you have an app developer who has, uh, they've got a Raspberry Pi, they've gotten three or four sensors, and they've got libraries for those sensors. Yeah. They want to connect all of those sensors and control them from their console app. They need to be able to understand that the the, the, the library needs to understand that the pins that they get passed in, they own, but they don't own the controller because there may be another library using that controller simultaneously. <clears throat> I see. From within the root console app. So why do you say, so they own the pins from the standpoint of which ones are which? Uh, of, of they are talking to that pin because their device, that sensor is connected to those pins. So they own them for the lifetime of that sensor. They being... The sensor. Oh, sorry. So, so I like, thought you were saying the yeah. app developer. No, no. So like, then we're you pass in five, six, seven, eight to the BME two eighty. Then for the lifetime of that sensor object, yes. it owns those pins yes. because, as far as it knows, um, it is the device connected to those pins and the only thing. Yeah. Well, it's right. kind of impossible. There's no coordination model. Right. Right. One thing we do do with this, this this particular chip. I am looking at it. It. it can you talk to it just using kind of GPI or all? But like all the docs I am able to find are about the you know the I two C and the and SPI, right? You uh, mean for this particular yeah BME two eighty yeah yeah between BME two eighty you can't just talk to but talk to GPIO you can't well, you need right. to set up SPI or I2C. you can probably right. bit bang it with um, okay. sure you can yeah. do like but I think you need like the clock and. I think you do need... Uh, yes, but, so that's probably not the best example. But like, for example, we could have a, a, a different sensor, which is like an LCD display. That one doesn't right. use SPR or doesn't use sure. uh, okay. I2C. That one just uses GPIO yeah. uh, pins. So the, the, the reason why this one is interesting, right, because of like the, I, I never know which one is which. One of the buses lets you connect multiple sensors to it, right? Yeah, yes. SPI, SPI does that. Yeah. So, um, you know, like um. now there's a there's a combination, a, a kind of in between uh, of these two models. So, if the application is just using a BME 280, all they care about is pin numbers. But the BME uh, 280 would say, okay, I'll take those pin numbers and I will open those GPIO pins. So it's still object based in that sense. But well, the only thing though no. is that you can't. So you can open the pins, but you can't really rationalize about which pin mode 
Yeah, and also either. you cannot really, you don't really have a choice which pins to use on Raspberry Pi in particular, right? It's just like the SP, you can only, if you have the SPI, you can only use like those pins. Right? That's right. right. Yeah. Oh, uh, so. Well, and also with, with SPI, it's not even really, so you have to use pins from a physical wiring setup, but from a software side, you don't specify pins at all. Yeah. You specify the SPI device. Cause yeah. SPI isn't really, isn't pins in, in, a, in a software yeah, sense. It's a device. It's a device. A bunch of pins. In that case, still, you could still work with two SPI devices on the same, uh, in, on the same Raspberry Pi, right? Because at least Raspberry Pi well, has two different SPI. Yeah, it does. But I think it's, well, the other thing I think we need to elaborate on is, is if you did use the chaining thing on a, on a single, SPI device, how would that look like from an orchestration perspective? Like, um, does it change what it is that you pass in to the, um, the BME 280 thing? Or do you actually need, like, yeah, when you use chaining, what do you pass in to the SPI device? If you go into the, I think that in that case, you would have I've to write that. your own library for, for that specific device. Yeah, I, I because, so we do expose in, in our SPI namespace, we do expose kind of like a way of uh, getting the connection settings from a different device and then initializing your own device based on that, which is basically kind of like a chaining from the addresses uh, so yeah. that you can connect multiple do, do devices. Do you have a sample for that? I don't have a sample code for that. I have the classes. I have like the reference. Yeah, we should. We need to write that. I haven't done it yet. Right. And, and I think it's it, not hard. I think for the chaining scenario, it's the same thing as regular GPIO, and you've got microcontrollers going down several layers. Where, if the user is expecting multiple devices to exist uh, that are trained in any fashion, they'll have to write some kind of shim that that is the thing that takes ownership of the pins and then correlates to the next devices, which right. owns it. And maybe since I2C and SPMI and stuff allow this inherently, we should look at providing yeah. some built-in mechanism to make that easier for people. Yeah, we're actually about to run into the exact same thing with our serial port implementation that you're working on, Christoph. The um, RS485 thing. So I'm wondering if we'll need to do something similar there. Yeah, I haven't looked into that. No, I know, I know, I know. I'm just saying. Yeah, I, I don't know how well would it work uh, for for actually like if I'm just writing a library to control my sensor. I don't know how how good would it work if you want to change a uh, chain from yeah, devices but, to that. But uh, clearly, if we build an API that assumes. That you're never chaining with a protocol that supports chaining. No, our API yeah. supports chaining. It's just that if you write your library, I don't know if you can write it in a way that you support chaining yourself. Or I mean, well, you definitely can with our well, API. Well, but but if, it you, would... if the API takes in an SPI device, which basically has an address, wouldn't that? And I don't know enough about this particular protocol yet, but wouldn't that kind of assume? Wouldn't the sensor assume that it was the only device on that, uh, the only sensor using that SPI device at that address? It would. Yeah. Yeah. So, so looking at this, there is a master and several slave devices for right. SPI. So it's the yeah. same thing with regular GPI, where, where you have a microcontroller that itself is responsible for the communication with any devices connected to it. Um, Right. It's this here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know it has master yeah. slave. Yeah. But we just haven't written the code for. But I, I think it's the same slave. concept of like. You still have the. I, I guess in the case of SPI, then there there's actually like an SPI controller, which owns the pins, and then yes. there's several devices below that which don't own the pins, but they communicate through those pins. Yeah, although if there's only ever one device, then you you don't get exposed to any of that complexity. Yeah. It's only when when there are slaves that you need to deal with it. Yeah. Uh, and I haven't I, I don't know what that looks like. Yeah. There, there's so a few articles that looks on it. Yeah, we so. need to elaborate on it further. I don't think we should spend much more time on 
on that, other than if this was a GPIO device, which it isn't, mm -hmm. then um, I think the only real interesting thing here is how does the whole dispose thing work because you're specifically using the dispose pattern as it relates to the controller. Right. And I, th I think the answer is it doesn't work well. It doesn't. That's why we kind of want to go where in, a, in a world where the same, like the sensor is the one that owns the, uh, the pins. The pins. But not the, the controller. Not the controller. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so in, in the case of chain GPIO, you'd have, you, you wouldn't be creating a BME 280 directly. You'd create a microcontroller, which you, you then would create the BME 280 on, I think. So you'd have the Pi, which is the root controller, you'd create the subcontroller, and then you'd create the 280 on the yeah, sub Sounds like a lot of complexity. <laughs> well, if you're chaining devices. Well, I, yeah, I, I think we just need to elaborate that one further. It's like, for, for the case where you're not chaining, it's literally this simple. But for the case where you do chain, then you have to have another nest in there yeah. where you create a microcontroller device, pass in 5, 6, 7, 8, and then the BMA 280, you pass in whatever pins you're, you're talking about. Basically saying you have to create some kind of an envelope. Yeah. The one thing back to the app running the controller that I raised with Jose is um, with all the samples that I've been creating, I've been creating a control C event handler um, that does cleanup. And it's, it's particularly obvious with LEDs um, if you do control C and don't have a handler because the, the, the LEDs are left in an undefined state. Some of them are lit, some of them are not, and you want them all to be unlit. And I was thinking that. Um, so the control C handler is mostly only obviously used for like the, the interactive scenario, but you can imagine in like a Docker environment, which is which is what most of these customers are going to be running, that signals are used to terminate applications, um, which is very similar obviously to control C, and it seems like very it seems like the app would always be the one that would be implementing those handlers that the sensors never would be, because that would be super bizarre. Yeah. Um, and um, that just kind of pushes further to the lifetime being with the app. And that the, these sensors would never use the dispose pattern unless there was some other state that they needed to dispose. Okay. Right? I if, mean, the, if the controller is literally the only state that... You they, could still... You could still like have a finalizer or a dispose in your in yeah. your uh, app, w which what it does is if, if you get an exception or if if you get a signal to to terminate, you can go in and call dispose on your sensor. Like you still yeah. Yes. Right? So, but if if the dispose on the sensor is only to help clean up the controller, then you might, like the thing you want to avoid is say you have like sixteen sensors that you're working with. You don't want to have like you don't, want, for every you don't because you can't even write a for each loop on that. Um, you don't want to um, do it on every sensor just to clean up the controller because then why don't you just clean up the controller and call it good? Right. Um, the the idea behind that was that you in your console app you didn't have to deal with controllers yourself. Yeah, you but didn't I, have to reference system devices. I know. know. Well, yeah. Isn't that the use case for safe handles since they inherit from a critical finalizer object, though? That way the runtime will always give it a chance to run, even if you abort the thread or throw or, or unload the app domain or anything else? Is, is that right, John? So I actually asked David Wrighton about this yesterday. Um, and he said, I asked him, what guarantees do we have on finalizers being run on shutdown? Oh, and he said, in, he said in .NET Framework, there's like a best effort thing that's mm -hmm. like two seconds long. Right. And he said in Core CLR, there's no such best effort period. Basically, yeah. no yeah, that's correct. No finalizers are run. And he said there's an ongoing conversation between him and Jan conversation on, on said topic. Not, not even for the critical finalizers? No. Safe handle? Yeah. So the, the, the kind of the running the finalizers during shutdown. Uh, the the problem is like uh, it it it's racing with the, the in typical app you know typical app has a bunch of async stuff going on and mm -hmm. the moment you start running the the finalizers on the background thread, 
in parallel with the foreground activity that's still working on the objects, you that you get deadlocks and crashes. Yeah, it's basically um, shut down as a hostile environment. Oh yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> uh, to put it. Yeah. And, and you know you have basically a bunch of code running, and you know like there's like stuff being pulled out of it. Yeah. So uh, I don't have a strong statement about the the discussion, more just the fact that if we want to provide people with a um, reliable way of cleaning up, then it probably can't be via finalizers. And it also can't be via library code, which leads me to the conclusion that it can only be an app code as part of unless they say, signal handler. <clears throat> unless they say in their shutdown, like you said, you know, they handle the signal via control C. Sure, sure, sure. Else. But then that's still not finalizers. You can, right. you can but do, in that case, they could say just you can, dot run all finalizers or whatever. Or they could just that. specifically target the. Um, the yeah, that's true. We, we do have an event that you can subscribe to that's called when you are shutting down, right? And in that event, you can specifically do the clean, kind of clean up, but sure. you, you kind of need to be very careful how you do it because of... Now we're just arguing about which event it is. Yeah. Right. Um, the point, though, is more, what's... Is it in library code now. or user code, like meaning app code? I think we're saying it's in app code. And then what is it that the app code does, somewhat irrespective of which event they, they handle? And I think it would be like controller.cleanup. Right. Yeah. I, I if you have multiple sets, that's what makes more sense. Yes. I don't know why we would do anything else. And then also, it seems like we shouldn't be encouraging sensors to, to implement disposable. I dispose, I disposable, unless they have some other resource other than the controller to dispose. Makes sense. Because then it's like this. If it's just the pins, then they shouldn't. I don't. I don't see why we would. Control anything. Makes it sense. Seems like it would be. Getting them to do something that's going to cause you to pain. Okay. Makes sense. Um, and then I don't know, like you know, I don't know if you want to show uh, the reference assembly of, or if instead we want to uh, look at through API reviewer. So I think we have half an hour. We can try to do that. Probably it's not a bad thing. I think more interesting would be like what the action items are for the next steps. Like, is there, like, it seems like there's still a bunch of feedback on the, what the interactions would be, which probably might be better to go over them first, address them, and then do an actual pass over the API once we're happy with the interactions. Otherwise, we're just nitpicking names for no reason at this point. Yeah. Like, once you know what, what customers are supposed to do, whether things are static, whether they're instances, whether it's disposable, then I think it makes sense to review the API. Otherwise, you just review names, like, five times over, and then they may actually change because you... Yeah, we don't have the type. Did you change the concept? Yeah. Um, like, is there any particular things you want to get feedback on, or? I mean, the controller class is definitely what, uh, it's the most important, that one that you just scrolled over. Uh, yeah, don't do that. I can tell you that right now. Uh, sorry, little utils. <laughs> oh, that's going to, that, that was going to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah actually, actually we here. could get, you and I discussed <laughs> an idea there. Right. We could get feedback on so that. So we, we could do that. So basically, uh, we went with uh, and met with a few customers uh, last week, and then some of them uh, they were dealing with uh, they were they were basically making like LoRa devices that communicate with I IoT Edge, and uh, they were saying that once they're setting up the, uh, the uh, like a new Pi that's gonna be basically like kind of like a LoRa gateway, they always hit the issue uh, and and they forget every time that uh, SPI protocol needs to be enabled in right. the Raspberry Pi through config and it needs a reboot. Um, I actually didn't didn't uh, check because the ideal thing they, they said obviously is if there some if we expose a method that can just enable SPI for you that would be ideal. I think that it's not possible but I haven't validated that. But at least we can definitely check if SPI is enabled or not. So they just wanted us to expose that API. So it's a question of where. Right. The, the question would be where. There. Yeah. yeah, yeah. SPI device. Well, so we could do it there. Like, I mean, I mean, generally speaking, if you, I mean, there's nothing wrong with having that API. 
there's just everything wrong with a YouTube class somewhere. Yeah. Well, why not just expose it on the controller? You can then... The well, controller, we have a GPIO controller, we have a PWM yeah, controller. You, you, if you want to do it on the controller, you would do it on, on SPI device, like Emo just said. Right. That's, that's the controller. That's the controller okay. for SPI. For SPI. Yeah. yeah, actually, I guess that makes yeah. sense, because by definition of targeting SPI, you're already using an SPI class. Right. Okay. Yeah, so that's just... So it makes sense to have it there. Yeah. Right. Have it on each one. Okay. Where we can expose it. But a controller could have something like get devices or something like that, and one of them could be SPI device if it's present and it's, oh, oh, this is... But which controller? What? We which thought about that. that. Well, well, at the root, we there's one controller, which is the Raspberry Pi. We yeah. thought about adding a board, yeah, we, a, a board class yeah. the that would basically I, have these kind of methods. Yeah, the reason I didn't think that was a good idea is yeah, it's just we, a we, second we, entry point to do the same thing. Like, uh, it's what users will need to do if they've got any sub devices. Mm, could be interesting for that scenario. Yeah, I mean the interesting scenario is like when SPI is actually disabled and like should you like show the device or not? Because well, you can technically enable it with you know, like some, uh, like with software and like then trigger well, the user, right? Yes, but Which then is kind of like a weird state or Yeah, so I think what they were asking for is. Um, you know, and is SPI enabled method, and then if it's disabled, then they just write diagnostic information, right? To tell them like, oh, you're an idiot. I already know how they want to work around this because they asked me for one feature in the CR ports, which they want to use it for resetting the device. So they actually want to use one of the pins to connect to the reset button and like, uh, <laughs> you like <laughs> set a flag on the CR port that it resets the device. Okay, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> to do it automatically. Self-healing. Hopefully it doesn't get into some infinite reboot loop. Happens. Um, yeah, because also if you're running into containers, there's really no place to save state. Right. Uh, yeah, other places where uh, feedback would be nice. I mean, all the venting, I think we, we talked about. Feedback to death. Uh, Go up okay. email. Let's see if there's anything else. Um, well, and just looking, so uh, real quick, just looking around, it looks like there's some people who have taken regular GPIO pins, connected additional SPI microcontrollers to those. Yeah, that's what, that's the bit banging. Yeah. So I have done that. Yeah. It works pretty well. <clears throat> yeah, and and so then you you have the interesting case of, um, y you have a secondary. Software, software SPI and software I2C, we don't yeah. have that in here. In the proposal, we just have hardware support for PWM, SPI, and I2C. Yeah, we could add that, definitely, that later. Yeah. So one other comment we got on the YouTube video was, one thing to maybe consider is I2C GPIO expander like MCP23008 to allow library to provide GPIO that would act like any other GPIO. Google MCP two three zero zero eight then to Eno Foundation for details. Yeah, we actually already implemented that. Yeah. Okay. So what does like it literally mean? that exact <laughs> that exact thing. one? Rich already. I already implemented that. I, I created a MCP three thousand eight dot cs, mm. um, right. and it supports both SPI and GPIO. So what what does that mean in terms of English? Like I have no idea what this. Yeah, like, I mean, it's just a bunch of words. I'm like, it's awesome. But you know what it is. I have no idea. Another tab. Okay, open another tab. I can do that. That's the English. Yes. Go to our private repository, which is .net slash IoT. People are gonna love this. No, 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 no. No, no. IoT. IoT. Just IoT. Yeah. Oh my God! You just leaked the repo publicly. Yeah, that's okay. That's fine. It's gonna go to source. Source, yes. Uh, devices. devices. And the only one there is the MCP. <laughs> <laughs> MCP three zero. It's a different number, but they're both Okay, so go to .cs. <coughs> so what this does is it um, has two constructors. One is it takes a controller with a set of ints. Uh, and this is before this conversation even happened. This is what I naturally did. And the reason is, is because you have to set these pins in different modes. So the mode is part of the algorithm. Nice. So this is if you want to do bit banging. 
So that's the one constructor. Right. So and that's using the other GPIO constructor protocol. where you pass in an SPI device. So hold on. So the user calls this guy and they decide what is the CIK, what is the MSIO, yeah, what right. is the MSIO IP. Those are the four GPIO pins that you need to pass in to okay. do bit banging. Right. Or you do SPI. So these are mutually exclusive. But then which 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 one you do I then, see. then this is the interaction model, read. Right. And which, which it's read supports either of these constructor types. And so if you um, Yeah, if you're in an if you have an SPI, you do, you do this, this else system. you do this. Right. And then um, it it's um, what's the word? It like proxies that to the specific private implementation. I right? see. And I ported it from this code. Right. So it was Python code that did exactly this thing from A to fruit. I see. And then if you do SPI then it's somewhat simpler. So I think that's what this guy's asking. Okay, for. so basically it just means other, you're you're having one algorithm that can either do GPIO or you have a sensor library that can work with both protocols of the Yeah, sorry, that's what I mean. Yeah. Right, yeah, right. basically we can find it. And we have the same API. for other examples in Corfex Lab. Like we yeah. do it for the BME two eighty actually. So what we should do is, is we should um fix the implementation. That will be good. Oh I don't know how to Besides that, yeah. Um, um, what we should do is actually we should use this SPI device and the BME 280 thing and figure out how to, to make them coordinate on SPI at the same time with the master slave thing. Is this a general thing that you have, this is an ongoing thing where you have like three protocols and you want one type to represent them all? So it occurred to me to, pr to build two different MCP implementations like underscore GPIO, underscore SPI, but then um, then it breaks type identity. If anyone ever wants to expose methods that take an MCP, yeah. unless so you result, have a base, unless you have an abstract I base. I guess unless you have a base, which I, I didn't even base. consider that. So anyway, that's why I went with this. It's also exactly what the Python code did. Yeah. Right. Um, so the reason I, I'm asking because it, if we have this, and we may want to think about how we lay them out in terms of names and namespaces, right? So that. Like you don't want to put those kind of types because now you have a GPIO well, namespace and you have a, an SPI namespace. Well, but what this way is different, go, right? right? So this, this is, is not uh, this. This is a sensor library, so this will not shift. So with. let me just explain okay. this. <laughs> so what our plan is is to build a first-class sensor library for the protocols that Jose already mentioned. Okay. And then we want to have a community-maintained set of. Um, bindings for sensors and Sensor chips, implementations. Okay. which will also live in this repository. So this is the first one of them. We right. actually have some other ones that are on branches in the repository that we're building. Right. And then the thing we're talking about is whether we um, go with source distribution or binary distribution nice. for those. I think we will end up doing binary, meaning NuGet distribution, because source distribution is not great. Relatively shitty, and, and also it's even shittier <laughs> if um, Docker is your main deployment mechanism. Or you want to use VB and you don't know how to compile CS files. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, there, there is that too. <laughs> um, so I think it pretty much has to be NuGet distribution, but our idea is, and we came up with this funky namespace too. IoT device. I, I had no idea what to call that thing. Richard's grab bag would be. Well, <laughs> the question is, is do we want if they're all going to be in this repository? Now we're getting way off into the weeds, by the way. But well, we have twenty minutes left. Yeah, if they're all going to be in this repository, sh should we put like emo dot and rich dot, or should we tell, or should we say, if you're going to be in this repository and be like in this semi-official category? of um, bindings, then you have to adopt this particular namespace pattern so that customers get, they don't have like 17 different usings. It's, it, it's, these are basically the .NET Foundation set of um, community supported um, sensor Sensors. and, and, and uh, chip bindings. Does that kind of make sense to you? It does. I mean, like I, it's not, actually not completely unrelated to that conversation we had with James yesterday. Yeah, I mean, like it seems like logically, like, you know, like an essentials kind of thing, right? Yes. But I mean, and then you're not tied down to the one protocol. Like you right. don't have to think about a namespace of like, this yeah. side to all the I two C devices. These are all the SPI. Devices. It seems to me like it's just a separate NuGet package that right. might have a slightly different support Definitely. policy on it. But like in the end. 
Definitely. Exactly. I would just treat it like as any other .NET project where there's some coding guidelines, there's some namespace rules, and yes. exactly. people I, contribute I, I, to I, that. That's, and that's, 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 the, that's, point. that's yeah. the point. But it won't be in the same NuGet packages um, as, as the, the main G, as the main that, that, Yeah. It'll be something separate. But even if you, if what Jan said is true, right, even the other one might not last for five years, right? Even the other one we may have to change in two years from now because, well, the whole ecosystem has changed their minds on how they expose pins on blah, right? Yeah. In which case, you know, what is more official, right? Um, okay, does that make more sense then to the question? It, um, I think it seems that. like it. There's some the response now. Are these GPIO pins added to same controllers? How can I pass the eight pins to different library? How can I pass the what? This eight pins. I'm not sure what you mean. Maybe since these There's eight only four pins. pins. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, he talks about MCP 23008, right? Which might be slightly different from the one you have. Yeah, mine was 3008. Maybe the other one has 8 pins or 4 pins. If it know. uses, yeah, it might use like GPIO, so like the LCD, uh, for sure, example. Sure, but then it would just be 8 pins in the constructor. In the constructor, right. so that's it. Four. So right. I think you would pass around that type then, right? Not individual pins, right? Well, you if you if when you new up the, the type, you, you need the, the 4 or 8 pins, but then when you pass it to other code, then it's just solely the type. Right. Right. I think the, the yeah. object. So basically, the idea is you would pass around this. Yeah, the library yeah. would support that, a constructor that takes in there. the eight pins. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the library has to support any pin configuration, and then that's the, legal for that. Then, then the app author yeah. gets to decide how they physically connected it to yeah. their. If it supports device. multiple protocols, maybe they, they don't have that have many pins like open, right. so they want to use SPI. Yeah. Maybe you should have something like protocol, and then SPI would be one of the. Protocols and the other one would be like whatever the MSI communication is called. Like, and that is SPI. This is all SPI. It's software SPI and hardware SPI. Right. So maybe, yeah, software SPI device and for what? another. No, but protocol. a same. So the thing we were saying is that the, a same device, a same sensor, could implement or be able to communicate through two different protocols, right? And I I understand, but like. In the end, like you kind of communicate some value in the end, right? So you communicate like a number or something, right? Yeah, but like here's the here's the thing, like see that very first thing under read where it says if ABC channel is not in this range, mm -hmm. like this particular one, um, uh, like different devices may treat those channels. They may be expecting different data in different channels differently, maybe. I, or put it this way, I'm not sure if all devices, um, oh yeah, now I know what I'm trying to say. Like this implementation is, um, go, go down um, to the, go down further. Email. That's right. I only have one, one keyboard for two screens. Uh, keep on going. Yes. Uh, oh, it's too far. I was expecting something else to be here. If only you wrote the code. Could yeah. you add the code for him? <laughs> um. <laughs> okay, there's... Basically, this is a 10-bit device. And so, um, so some of the code, I can't remember where it is, is oriented on it being a 10-bit device, a 10-bit SPI device. But maybe there's some other device that's like a 24-bit or 16-bit device, and then... True, but, uh, yeah, but what I'm saying is, like, you create something like, I don't know, like, SPI kind of abstract, you know, abstract sense, and then you say, hey, this is a hardware SPI implementation, this is a that, that was the first constructor. There, there was two constructors. Yes, yes, what I'm saying, instead of the two constructors, have it one, and the implementation on the MISO MOSI make it another, the implementation of SPI device. Yeah, maybe. But yeah, what you are saying is, like, it would be nice if Everybody who has this like duality and wants to do like the SPI Big Bang right, doesn't have to copy and paste. Yeah, that, that was my right. comment earlier. Of maybe we should provide a <coughs> built-in software SPI yeah, device, that, and then then you yeah. would have one constructor. You would just pass in. Fair enough. The, the software implementation that we provide, and it would just work, yeah. quote unquote. Yeah, that sounds like a good goal. Yeah. So we could figure out how to do that too. 
Okay, I don't think it's gonna be like a generic interface for all of the devices, but if we at least kind of establish some kind of pattern, then maybe it won't be the same. For example, like BME two eighty, it it supports two it supports two different protocols. It supports uh, I two C and it supports uh, right. SPI. But can there be software implementations of both of those? Yes, but they take different number of pins, so you still have to have two different constructors. R right, but I think we were saying you you, you have. For, for the case where you are bit banging, you have a software um, implementation for both I2C and SPI. That way you don't have to provide three constructors. You provide the, 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 the devices that they're meant to communicate through, and then you provide the software implementation without having to provide a third constructor for that, for the GPIO case. I see. In, unless GPIO was an explicit configuration that supported outside of bit banging. I see. Yeah, I would expect like whatever like kind of protocols you use, there's something like hey read ten bits or something, and that would yeah. essentially be kind of like this abstract kind of interface. <clears throat> so the guy in the chat says, "Oh, I see where the confusion comes from. MCP three zero zero eight is ADC, which I guess is a the analog, analog digital equipment. What is it? Converter or whatever? Analog digital converter. Yeah, and MCP two three zero zero eight, which is what he's talking about, is a GPIO expander. Oh." So like he says, like goal of chip is to add new pins to app. How can I use these new pins in different library? You, oh. you, you wouldn't end up have that. That's the case of you, you have to create a microcontroller basically, where you, you've got your root pie, yeah, I, I, I and think then you he, have the device. He's got a point. Like it seems like it, there has to be yeah. some kind of three three structure. Yeah, it, like it, if you're adding example, additional like, pins through another device, then what you basically have is you've got a root device, a child device, and then the the sensor connected to the child device has to talk to the child device, which then talks to the parent device. Even if it's passed through, there's still that I layer see. of indirection there. So let me try to write this down because I, I barely understand what you're saying. Um, if only I find my notes now. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's a different. Uh, here we go. Um, but still, like the controller, like uh, let's say you want to query, hey, I want to get all of the. I don't know, like, uh, term, like term, temperature, like controllers, or like something like that, and then you have kind of like one directly connected to the board and one indirectly through like some SPI kind of interface which yeah. exposes another pins or something, yeah. and you still want to kind of be able to see both of them in the yeah. Well, so well then, then when you write your controller library, yeah, you probably need to pattern the. You, you, you would have to provide a mechanism to return that data. Because there's like, if, if you've got one Raspberry Pi that's connected to another Raspberry Pi, <coughs> which then has the sensor, you have to have some way of saying, um, hey, second Raspberry Pi, what devices do you have connected to you? And it has to be able to return it. Because there's no way that the first one can have that knowledge otherwise. I just wrote down something. Hopefully, you can. I will post the notes later, and you can bang on that one. Okay. Um, just bang on it. <coughs> Wordsmithed. Um, I guess last piece of feedback that would be interesting is if we have an overall agreement that just having ints is uh, a better solution than than having a pin object. I think in general, like if we, I mean, it seems to be the nine we said earlier, right? Maybe we should avoid having a you know, controller thinking that you have to dispose as well, right? So try to just minimize the number of things people have to new up and manage lifetime with, right? Right. A controller be, seems like it still needs to be there, but at least uh, getting rid of the pin object. Yeah, like, uh, yeah, I'm not saying a particular like implementation, but it's like the, you know, the, the, the argument is, like, if you look at Python, it's just super simplistic, right? And, like, it seems to work I, I, really I well. I think for the pins, I, I would say no, no special objects, but there could be an object for set up, setting them up or, or like something like that. So right. The setting up is easy, but the, at the same time, we can use them with numbers, which is yeah. usually easier. And, and when, when you're talking about I, IoT, you're doing very low-level stuff. You're messing with hardware and individual sensors. So it, I think it makes sense to have a lower-level API here that people can then use and build up their own abstractions if they want to. Okay. The weird thing about that is that underneath, there's going to be a pin abstraction anyway for each controller slash driver. So you'd end up having a... Uh, well, not with SysFS, right? Uh, yeah, even with SysFS, because you need to keep track of 
um, you know, yeah, there's the, gonna file, be the a, open file, handle, be, um, a couple other other properties. Right. Um, I mean, there's gonna yeah, there's gonna be a dictionary of the stuff that we have open. Yes, in right. the control room. Right. But you so, don't have to expose that. Yeah. Yeah, but but that's oh, kind yeah. of the difference of like we have to provide some kind of API and we can't just we can't expose everything right. like we're, we're not going to expose the, the file system directly when we can provide a nice wrapper for the 90% of people that need to, to use it okay sounds good and the last piece of feedback that I would like to get is uh, we were trying to also optimize for uh, docker container scenarios uh, and so we actually got this feedback from uh, from the same uh, customers where, Although we had we had seen this issue independently, right? Where um, imagine that you have like an app that basically controls an SPI device, for example, and uh, you have that app installed inside a Docker image, and you basically just want to push that image into a bunch of uh, well, a, a container of that image into a bunch of different devices. But in the different devices, you might want to change slightly the configuration of like which pin do they use and 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 to which pin is it connected to. Uh, because for a specific Raspberry Pi, it might be using already the, the pins that that uh, the default app is trying to use. So for that, we kind of uh, added a, in the controller. Uh, can you scroll real quick? Uh, in all, in, well, not scroll, but switch to the other tab. And then scroll all the way down. Well, not all the way down, but I'll turn you. No, you've gone, no, you've gone too far. Uh, it's in the control. Uh, there you go. Oh, this one. Git, this one, this one right, right here. Right, right. So we expose, we expose that function called get pin number from config. And it basically will return you an int that basically you have a default value, uh, which is uh, if, if there's nothing provided, then it's going to use that as the default of, of where your, your pin is connected. And then it would have a kind of like a configuration name parameter, which for now, we're treating it as an environment variable because Docker containers only kind of support that. They don't really support um, having config files uh, very well unless you mount drives on them, and so it's not super trivial. So uh, what we thought that API would look like is that you would have kind of like a, the configuration name, you would say, like, I don't know, like MOSI, like uh, master, master app saving. Uh, and so you have that as a name, and then you have uh, like the default value in case you just want to use the default. So I guess we wanted some feedback in if, to see if that's something that like sounds reasonable. And uh, it would be nice if there was multiple ways to pass in configuration information. Yeah. So not just yeah, environment. We were like thinking like of environment variables that. and config files. We but just didn't yeah, find. Okay, yeah. But you know, the configuration problem for Docker, right? It's like independent <laughs> problem from this thing, right? No. Well, what do you mean? Like you have you you have this problem like for like everywhere in Docker, right? It's like you, you think you kind of want to configure the network ports that your Docker container talks to, right? Yeah. Um, or you know like all sorts of stuff, right? So uh, the 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 system sockets don't have kind of get socket <laughs> socket number from configuration API either, right? Um, well, actually, we for ASP.NET we have something very similar to this. Right, but ASP.NET is like well, so ASP.NET have method that looks exactly like this static mm -hmm. method that no 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 environment what, variable. Not exactly. What ASP.NET does is so you're right. The the Dockerism is basically you get to specify which ports are open between the, the host and the guest. Mm -hmm. So that's the dash P thing. The way ASP.NET works though is you can spe you can override which um, which ports it's going to use for for SSL and and raw raw HTTP. Yeah. And that's and mm -hmm. Kestrel reads all that configure information. So yeah, your app Kestrel is like so like application. Yeah, but so I think what you're saying is basically you would want the the user to just call and try to read an environment right. variable in their code well, with well, I might just do, I just want to say one more thing, which is in ASP.NET the app code is completely abstracted away from ports. 
Right, so that, that's at the level of the Kestrel web server. Mm -hmm. But you still have a way through environment variables to configure Kestrel, and then it, it will adopt those values. This case is a little bit different because since um, GPIO style programming is much lower level right. than, than web servers, mm -hmm. like meaning app, yeah. the application code you write for a web server, then your code is the one dealing with the ports. Um, in this case. So as a result, if we want to provide configuration, then user code, like, like this, then user code needs to interact with it. But the model on the Docker command line is effectively, that we're proposing here, is effectively identical to what ASP.NET has. It's just the user code model is different. Uh, I would maybe say that <clears throat> given that config files change over time, the way people configure things change over time, right. etc., we should we shouldn't have this on the controller. We should probably have a separate, if we're going to provide some default functionality along with this, we should have a separate class that allows you to abstract away and read that information from whatever you want, and then you can pass that in. So it's, it's both easy for the app developer to get that information, whether it's in an environment variable, a JSON, XML, INI, whatever, and then pass that down to the controller when they create it. Uh, that makes sense. I mean, from a user standpoint, really what they would want is um, you can um, you can specify like a params list of strings, mm -hmm. and then you get an interray back. That would be, and then you can easily then you can um, uh, pass that that set of ints to the the program. Like if you basically have the um, the set of strings in a particular order, then you get the ints in a set of in a particular order, and then you can pass it to that that program that, that yeah. class that I wrote before that expects them in a certain order. That, that would be, I think, the best experience. Yeah. But yes, it doesn't have to be on. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that's my one feedback is don't put it on controller, but abstract it separately. That way, it can change independently. Where, where, where would you imagine that going? Well, you, so you could imagine a case where you have a like configuration reader, and then you can, as a like abstract base, and then you can sec section that out into a JSON config reader, an XML config reader, an environment variable config reader. That way you can, you, users can decide what configuration they want best, because, you know, Five years ago it was XML, right now it's JSON. Some people still use INI. Docker is going to want environment variables. Well, the Docker is like, they they, they up kind of building these other things on top of it, right? Yeah. The, the config maps that you can kind of use to uh, yeah. not deal with right. just environment variables. So. And then five years from now it's going to be something completely different. So okay. not, not hard coding this down to... In the controller. Okay. in the controller and to something that we can't change later and extend later to match what people expect is probably going to be goodness for long term. Okay. I was actually but would it ship, it ship in the same NuGet package though? No, I, I think we shouldn't have API for this at all. If somebody needs it, they can build it. Yeah, keep, keep, the, keep the singleness of focus. I mean, it seems like the, the, there is a, obviously a need for like mapping and naming to like a port no, number like like, uh, but it seems to me like for like a, a lot of devices there is some certain like uh, names which are they're gonna be used and they're gonna be set up on different places so like SPI is gonna be on and this this yeah and it's this. less about SPI but and like, more about so, GPIO. so it seems like we might <coughs> need to have something like that just kind of uh, perhaps like ship uh, ship like the configuration file along with the uh, on to the framework first top, so like if you yeah, use... Yeah, the problem is, is in this scenario, you can't ship the config and the app together. So the exact scenario is... Yeah, you have to get the config, like, uh, the moment you kind of deploy, like, the, the, the app is already deployed, you have to... No, because the image is pre-built. Hey, yeah, the image yeah. is pre-built, but, you know, like... I don't know. know. The, 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 I, I believe there are, like, a number of different ways people configure Docker images today already. There are. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's only there's three systems. Volume mounting, environment variable injection, or the, the actual app knows it has to call to some network service to get its configuration. 
Yeah, those are developable ones, but they are kind of on top of these. They are kind of developing kind of conventions, right? Okay. I know that like Kubernetes in particular have like this config map, right? That kind of yeah, that assumes you're using Kubernetes. Uh, right, but it's like, you know... Uh, Which most of these scenarios will not be. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I guess yeah, the yeah. feedback would be don't include it in the default package. I, I and if I we would. do provide it, then okay. provide it separately. I mean, we could, as um, a helper thing, not in this package, yeah. more like in this community-supported utils thing, we could provide... Um, if we continue with instance methods, we could provide an extension method on the controller. Yeah that does basically this. Well, and then I mentioned in the last meeting, a, a lot of the setup for individual sensors is you're taking a data sheet, you're taking the raw numbers from it and converting it to code, and having a general format for automatically creating the boilerplate or C-sharp code from a data sheet would be incredibly useful for the majority of sensors. Sure. That has and nothing to do with this particular question, right? That's a totally separate It's kind topic. of on the similar premise, though, in that you're you're taking config information, which is pins and and timing stuff, and then pulling it into well, your Well, the, the data way. sheet thing is less oriented on pins, though, and it's more, inter, it's more oriented on, yeah. there's this leg coming off of this chip, and this is the data it's going to give you yeah. based on this clock. So that's not a pin thing. Okay. I mean, I can imagine like in uh, 10 years, you're going to have some kind of service where you can download the config which tells you, hey, where is the SPI on the device I am currently on. It seems, seems yeah. like it's kind of an extension yeah. point for the future. It does, but just... Perhaps it's not a good time. Yeah, this, kind of this particular right set of things, it has to tolerate offline. So everything... So, like, the, the, the thing that... Um, the IoT guys wanted for the the Laura case is basically the during deployment you basically in the um, like in the case when you're you're procure, not procuring like you basically say here's this IoT hub this IoT device I'm in IoT hub the website in Azure provisioning yeah that's the word I was looking for provisioning you basically say I would like to provision this app in the IoT marketplace which is a Docker image, to this device. It gets pushed down to that device. There's no opportunity to change the image itself because that's actually antithetical to the goals of Docker. And then the thing you're changing, the only thing you can change for configuration is the Docker run command line, which is where the environment variables come in. Yeah, yeah I think it's a valid scenario, but I think it's kind of, uh, I would say it's out of stock for, for now at least. For this particular API, yeah. yeah. Although for this API, there's a, there's a thought I had that which is maybe that. kind of out there, but instead of just a pin number, it could be a pin string, and that way, if you use an int, it's a specific hardware or GPIO pin, logical GPIO pin. But if you use a string, it's symbolically mapped to something else. But uh, then, and what would that be? Would be what you were saying, like an XML config or a Well, the whole point of this, though, is that you do provide a default. Yeah. Because the config is not required to be there. Not it's a, right. it's an additive thing. So it feels like you need both. And also, the symbolic thing that you would want to link to is definitely not the default pin number. You need a symbolic name. I'm not sure if you're providing a Docker container, you would necessarily want to provide a default if it can vary from device to device. You might want to force a config in that case because it's the safer option. Sure. Yeah, then that would be up to the, to the app developer. But yeah, yeah, I can see how that could be. So like one more question, it's like, like a about kind of usability. The, the image. So, so you, you were saying that SPI oh, supports multiple devices, right? Yeah. So say I have a detector and like to fetch or something, or try IoT for whatever reason, but uh, I, and I want to write two apps, like one for control and the fetch and the other one for the kettle. So I, it's going to be actually two apps. Is this going to kind of work together or is it have to be one app? It, it's going to work. As long as they're connected and hooked up to different pins, it should just work. Different pins, different pins. Yeah. What, what, what the SPI? Oh no! If you want to, if you want to do SPI chaining, then you do have to have the same console app. Yeah, you'd have to have. If you wanted to have two different apps, you'd still have to have some um, coordinator 
Yeah, there's no between the two. No, no, I was kind of wondering if it's like would it be possible to solve this problem. Yeah. Like, it seems like it's kind of separate problems to control the bridge and the cable, so it feels like it should be two options. But you're doing it through the same pins. Sure, but it supports multiple devices, right? Yeah, well, it's like if you if you're doing individual pins, then you've got a direct communication device, so you can have two different apps controlling two different sensors, but if you're using something which itself has sub-devices, then you have to have some kind of coordinator there, and so right. users could write a service that allows you to say, hey, controller, I want these, I want this device from this sensor. Right. But I, I think that might be out of scope for what the framework should provide in terms of... Yeah. Yeah. They should be writing their own. Yeah, I think if we like kind of have a good protocol for um, this communication, we could perhaps get like a virtual device later, for and then have like a service or something running hey for all of SPI devices. Yeah, perhaps. But I think it'd be interesting, like hackathon, show what we can do, provide the code in a community manner. But I don't think ever is part of the VCL. I don't think that's where that type of thing. Is. That's fair enough. Right. Right. All right, then I think I can call it. I already shared the notes um, there on GitHub, so comment on them, and then we get them merged. All right, thanks, guys, online, and then see you at some point later.